day to our Every Nation Willows family and to everybody that's joining us. Uh, it's great to have you with us. And today we have the great privilege of uniting with so many different Every Nation churches throughout our nation in as we unite in participating in our Every Nation South Africa um, Rebuild Conference. So this is a great moment for us as a movement within our nation. And I want to thank you. Thank you that you've set time aside to participate and prioritize this moment as it's something that we as a, a, a movement really value. So thank you. And in the next session, you'll be able to worship with us. And there will also be two impartation sessions from two of our great speakers. So my prayer for us this morning is as we unite and as we gather around a bigger calling, that one, that you will personally experience God speaking to you and that you would walk away from this moment with God imparting something in your life. But secondly, my prayer is that as we gather as a, as a nation, uh, every nation group, a movement of churches in our nation, that God would lift up your eyes and give you a heart for the calling that He's placed on us as a movement, a calling that we need to fulfill in this nation, in this season, but not just for our nation and not just for ourselves, but a calling that stretches beyond the borders of South Africa. May God really stir you this morning for what He has called us to as a movement to do in this world. So once again, thank you, and may you have a blessed time with us today. Welcome Every Nation Southern Africa family. My name is Carol Mkize, and it is my joy to be your host for the first part of session two of our very first online conference, Rebuild. I don't know about you, but I was really impacted by our time together last night. Thank you, Pastor Gillian, Pastor Chris, and Cape Town team for leading us so powerfully in a time of refreshing. This morning, we are shifting gears. This session is about repurpose. Now, before you start thinking that we're scheming to repurpose the church or repurpose who we are as Every Nation Church, that's not what we're doing. This session is about reminding us of who we are as the church, as the people of God, what our purpose is and what God's purposes are for us, especially during this time. You know, during times of seasons of uh, storms and trials, we have the opportunity to repurpose our lives with God's purposes. And it is my prayer this morning that you would hear God speak to you about repurposing your life with His purposes. We're going to hear from a good friend of mine from Mauritius, as well as the president of our movement. And so we're in for a treat. But before that, let us go to worship together. Over to you, Lebu. of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run in and they are safe in the name of the Lord there is power yes you are the name above all Strong tower, the righteous running. 
seems the atmosphere, atmosphere. Sailor, hey, 
Father, we salute you, King of kings, Lord of lords. We salute you, the one who can calm the storm from every tongue, every tribe, every nation. We lift up our hearts. We lift up our hearts to you, O King. We lift up our hearts to the one who gives us peace that surpasses all understanding. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing. Thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you, Father, that you are constant, never changing, faithful God. We lift up our hearts from where our our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, now we're going to move on to our next speaker or our first speaker for this morning. Her name is Roshni Mullen. Um, And she is from Mauritius. She grew up Hindu and uh, moved in 2000. She moved to Cape Town to study at the University of Cape Town. And um, after graduating, in fact, in her second year, she got saved. And after graduating, she joined the full-time campus ministry and um, went to the School of um, Campus Ministry in 2005. And that's where I met Roshni. And there are just two words that always remind me of Roshni and who she is. That's humility. Um, and she's so, she's, she has such humility. Um, and the second one is a friend indeed. Oh, a friend in need and a friend indeed. One of my closest friends. And I'm so grateful that we're going to be hearing from her this morning. So thank you, Roshni. We are ready for your message. Hello, Renation family. This is Roshni here from Mauritius. It's great to be with you all at this conference. Carol, thank you so much for introducing me. And thank you to the Renation Church in Rosebank for leading us in worship. In this session, we're going to look at how does God repurpose for rebuilding. The theme of this conference is to rebuild. And the three different focuses are refresh, repurpose, and release. And this session, we're going to look at just some stories in the Bible and some of the personal testimonies from my own life that I want to share about repurposing. You know, what comes to your mind when you think about the word repurpose? You know, I just think about things that were used for one purpose, for one thing, and now being used for another purpose. You know, to repurpose is to give a new meaning, is to adapt to something new. And you just think about just stories even in the Bible, or just man and woman whose life had been repurposed for a greater purpose. You think about Joseph. Joseph was a a rich kid that became a slave and became a prisoner and became a ruler in Egypt. Esther, who was a poor orphan girl, who probably never dreamt of being the queen of Persia. And then you see the story of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. And one day he had a life-changing conversation with his brother that led him to crying out to God. You know, he was weeping for a wall. How many of us, we weep for walls? You know, but he was weeping because God had given him a burden you know, and as God had given him the burden, he was crying out for it, just to God for a solution. And God used him to rebuild the war. And these are just stories of man and woman whose life had been repurposed. You know, I want to just share a little bit of the story of this house. You know, this house was abandoned, it was broken, it just had old things, you know. And even the garden looked like a dump site. It was just not very pleasant to be here. You know, this, is, this, this house was built by my dad, but I really felt, you know, just God saying to me, you know, trust me, you're going to rebuild this place and this is going to be such a blessing to you and to your family. I had no experience in construction, you know, I had never done anything like this before. 
and here I was finding myself, you know, just redesigning, you know, breaking down walls, you know, and just um, making new plans, you know, from the garden to the house, to the bathroom, to the kitchen. I just don't know how everything happened, but I know it happened. And that's just such a beautiful picture of how God rebuilds our lives. You know, nothing is a waste in God's eyes. You know, what, what people see as trash, you know, what people see as brokenness and God sees potential in those things. You know, I think for me, just, you know, looking back, just some, some valuable lessons that I've learned, you know, in the season of rebuilding, you know, how that's God's heart. God's heart is to rebuild. God's heart is to give a new purpose where, you know, we feel like we don't have any purpose. We feel like, you know, well, you know, we've, we've messed up, you know, um, how can God use us? But when we give him those areas, when we invite him in those areas of brokenness, he actually turns those things into something beautiful. He gives purpose to, to those things in our lives. And as we, as we think about even the theme of this conference about rebuilding, you know, suddenly we were hit by coronavirus, you know, and life came to a standstill, lockdown, you know, confinement, you know, just working from home or are you homeschooling your kids, you just suddenly, you know, everything has changed. You know, we receive some unexpected news and everything has changed. And how do we actually go through this journey, you know, where we actually maybe receiving unexpected news about our health or our job or our finances or family members. You know, just remember just a few years ago, I received some unexpected news that just brought life to a standstill. And I was still leading the campus ministry at UCT, you know, just loving my job and loving what I was doing. And then one morning, I, I got news that my dad had passed away. I can't even describe just the pain that I felt in that moment. Just the fears and the uncertainty, just not sure how life was going to look like for my family, for myself. And, you know, I just didn't know. Like, all I knew that life was going to look very different. And I just have to trust God for a new normal. And that was just... Um, just a very difficult time of my life, you know, just having to go through a season of rebuilding with my family, with with my mom and with my brother. And a year later, I, I made a decision to go back to Mauritius. And going back to Mauritius, you know, it was just full of uncertainty. I just didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I didn't know that, you know, whether we we're going to plant a church, a campus ministry, go into the marketplace. There was just too many unknowns, you know. All I knew in that time was I needed to be with my mom. I needed to be with my family. I needed to rebuild. There's just so much just a brokenness in the family, you know. It was just a season for us to rebuild, to unite and to rebuild. And I was going back to a country where I didn't really have friends. I didn't really have a Christian community. I got saved in South Africa and Cape Town. So to say that it was a humbling experience would probably be an understatement. You know, it was just a season of my life where I just felt deep sorrow and just disappointed, you know, just feel broken, feeling purposeless and sometimes useless. And just wrestling, you know, who am I? Like, what am I called to do? And just really just, just a, a difficult season of my life. And I remember just crying out to God. I was like, God, all I knew was to come to Mauritius, you know, and now I'm here. Like, I really don't know what I need to do. And, and just going through a season of rebuilding in my own life. Just, you know, when you go through, through times of disappointment, you know, just of deep sorrow, um, you know, areas in your own life that you may be ashamed of, you know, decision that you have made that you're ashamed of, you know, we kind of like, we don't want those areas in our life. We're like, how did we, how did that happen? And I went just through a season of accepting, accepting my journey and accepting my story and bringing those, um, those areas of brokenness and, and sorrow before the Lord. And I was just like, God, you know, I know there's a bigger purpose here. <laughs> And just God just started just healing me and rebuilding my own life and giving definition to my life and just crying out to God, just say, God, like, how do I even start? Where do I begin? 
and God just encouraging me just to focus on the things that I knew how to do. You know, my previous season in Cape Town was all about ministry. I knew how to pray for people. I knew how to preach to, to the students, you know, to share the gospel, to lead connect groups, you know, to raise up leaders. And that's all I knew how to do. And God just encouraging me to trust, to trust Him in that process. And I remember just waking up every morning, I'm like, God, I'm going to trust you today. You know, I'm sure there are people that you want me to reach out to and lead me to those people, take me to those places. So I just started driving around the island, like rediscovering the island again. And I would just find myself in fishing villages, you know, spending time with the kids, kids who meant to be at school, but because their parents just couldn't afford it, they were selling fish on the side of the road. And just just seeing the hopelessness, to see the brokenness on the island, you know, just seeing um, just how people live in the townships, you know, just I did not even know that there were townships on the island. Just being with families and hearing the stories, you know, sometimes just even practically helping them, you know, cleaning their house or, you know, just washing their dishes, you know, just being there. I just, it was just a beautiful season of my life. I felt like God was leading me to inspect the walls, you know, the broken walls and the gates that Nehemiah talk about. You know, we will never build something that we don't weep over. And, and I just felt that time God was giving me a burden for this country, just burden for it. For, for the people here um, and just I just started trusting the Lord for you know as I got one more family one more person one more kid that I want to reach out to and as I just being obedient to God just one day at a time one moment at a time you know rebuilding is is about that you know rebuilding is one brick at a time one moment at a time and I says just being obedient to the Lord, I just started feeling life flowing again, just a sense of purpose again and and just seeing how God was just leading me to different families and I I want to share one story. My friend invited me over to meet um, her mom and her brother who were wanted to know why I became a Christian um, and they were still Hindu then. And I was just quite nervous just going to their home and I was just like, I'm not sure what they're going to ask um, because I've faced a lot of rejection in Mauritius. So I was just not sure what to expect. And I went to their home and, you know, I just, they heard my testimony and I was just sharing just some, some stories. And after I finished sharing, they looked at me and said to me, we're ready to receive Jesus in our life. We can see what God has done in your life and we want is Jesus in our life too. I was just shocked, you know, I just probably were not expecting such a response, you know, and, but that story marked my life, you know, I just remember thinking, God, this is really you. This is, this is what you want to do. This is a picture of what you want to do on this island. You want to reach out to the lost, to the broken. You want me to partner with you to to see um, just a shift, to see this island being impacted, to be discipled. And the journey just carried on, you know, we, we started a, a connect group in December 2015. That was our first connect group that we started. You know, four or five of us, we just got together and we just pray and just encouraging one another. And, you know, we just saw that community growing in, you know, we just started reaching out to the, the expat community, the Mauritian community. You know, just seeing, just God bringing different groups of people together. You know, Mauritius, you find you know, there's a there's an expat church, you know, Indian church, but I've never seen like a diverse community coming together. And I just really felt like this was the what we were called to do. We were called to break down the the walls, the barriers, and to build a community. You know, from every nation, every tribe. You know, just bringing generations together, bringing cultures together. And the community just started growing. It's just amazing what the Lord has done in the last few years. And in 2018, we, we started having services here at my house. And just an amazing, just blessing to, to have a place where we can host people. And my house was becoming too small for the growing community. So we had to trust God for a venue for our services. And a year ago, we were looking at venues and 
you know, God led us to, to this beautiful venue where we have our weekly services. So we're going into our one year anniversary now, just really amazed by what the Lord has done in our lives in the last few years. And we know that this is the beginning of something much greater. It just, it's a sense of destiny over this church. Um, and I think as I look back, you know, just like, I've never thought that this is where we would be today. You know, oftentimes when you go through a season of brokenness, you know, you feel like, no, that's it, like God can't use me. But I just learned in this season that God takes those broken pieces of our lives and He He actually heal us, you know, He gives us a new purpose. You know, only only God can do those things in our lives. He takes those ashes and gives us beauty. And a life that is repurposed, a life that is rebuilt, really speaks about God's resurrection power. You know, you think about just even Joseph and Esther, you know, just Nehemiah, God just supernaturally, you know, bringing changes into their life, you know, repurposing their life for a greater purpose. And, you know, I love the story of Nehemiah as we think about rebuilding. I think there's just so much to rebuild in this season. Thinking about the economy, you know, just finances or family or churches or even relationships, you know, there's just so much, you know, I think... We're finding ourselves in a season where we really just have to hold on to what is certain, you know, who God is, the, the, the character of God, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. As I was going through a time of rebuilding, I, um, I just remember just going and reading through my journals. Just, I just needed to remember what God had done in my life in, in my previous season, you know, just amazing testimony, miracles and signs and wonders and how he provided supernaturally. It was just that was what was feeding my my soul and I was just drawing encouragement from previous testimonies. And I think even for us, you know, there's just a lot that is unknown at the moment. You know, but we we can hold on to to the truth of who God is in the season. And I want to just kind of like close now. I want to just, you know, share just two scriptures. But as we look at our lives, you know, maybe you've gone through, you know, some a season of, of pain and hopelessness. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how, whether the world have rejected you, you know, or the world had labeled you. It doesn't matter. You know, I think the story of Nehemiah really, you know, blesses me that the walls and the gates were broken for over 150 years and probably Nehemiah kind of like knew the facts that the walls were broken but in that moment where he had the conversation with his brother and he heard the news about the broken walls something happened God gave him a burden and oftentimes this is how it starts with a burden and that burden you know made Nehemiah crying out to the Lord you know he was weeping and and fasting and praying to God you know for for the rebuilding of the walls and I just really feel that this is the pointed time you know it doesn't matter what you've gone through in this season or I just the your own brokenness you know or you know whatever you're facing right now maybe some major shifts in your life you know, maybe you've received some unexpected news just about, you know, your job or your family, or, you know, the uncertainty of, you know, your kids' education, whatever, whatever you're going through. I feel like God just encouraging us in this time, you know, that this is the pointed time as we're getting all this news, you know, about, you know, things happening, you know, losing jobs or, you know, the loss of loved ones. But th I feel like this is just such an appointed time to, for us to rebuild. Just like God gave Nehemiah that burden, the vision and the purpose. He also gave Nehemiah the, the resources to rebuild. That God is giving us the resources that we need to rebuild in this season. Wherever God has placed you, whether in government or business or education that this is a season of rebuilding that may we partner with him to see you know a, a, a rebuilding happening in our own nation you know um, I want to just close with two scriptures Isaiah 41 verse 10 says do not be afraid I am with you do not be discouraged I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will hold you with my victorious right hand and the second scripture is it's from Nehemiah 2 verse 20 where it says the God of heaven, the God of heaven will give us success. And this is what I sense right now that God's saying I will give you success as we go on this journey of rebuilding that the God of heaven will give us success. Amen.
Wow, Rosny, thank you. What a powerful message. And I hope this is, uh, there's a lot of take-home value for each one of you. Um, Rosny is our leader from our Mauritius Church and uh, Mauritius Plant, actually. And keep on praying for her. I know many of you want to actually go on a mission there, but check your motives. Um, but you know what? As we continue this morning, I want to encourage you. We know we're meeting on different platforms and many of you are watching on Facebook now. And it's different for all of us. But you know what? It's the same faith. It's the same gospel. And it's the same Jesus we serve. And I want to encourage you. Let's keep on eyes on Jesus as we continue. And it's, it's actually an amazing privilege to have so many of our congregants actually participating in a conference the first time ever that we have so many of you participating because of lockdown. And that's the good news about this. And as we continue this morning, you know, it's my privilege to introduce to you somebody that I dearly respect has had a major impact on my life and many people's lives and many of you may hear him for the first time today, but many of you have been deeply impacted. A sincere, humble leader who loves Jesus and has modeled a way that we can follow. And I want to introduce to you our very own Pastor Steve Model, who is our founder of Every Nation, one of the co-founders of Every Nation, and also the founder of Every Nation Manila, which is called Victory Church. Victory now meets in 10,000 small groups across the city and about 80,000 people when they gather on their Sundays, which they're not doing right now. And this is amazing to see what God has done, not just in Manila, but from there planted in 22 other nations, you know, every nation churches and continue planting all over the world. Currently, he's no longer just living in uh, the Philippines. He's now living between Nashville, the Philippines and Delta Airlines, um, you know, moving all over the world all the time and serving our family with an open heart and a humble heart all the time. Him and his wife, Deborah, they have three children and two daughter-in-laws and then also four grandchildren. And you'll always see him bragging about his grandchildren. And that's what is so amazing. Pastor Steve is a humble man, but he loves family and he loves people. And we have an honor this morning to have no better person speaking into the purpose of this family. Pastor Steve Murrell, thank you. Welcome. Let's enjoy it. Roger and Nicola and our Every Nation Regional Leadership Team in Southern Africa and all of our pastors and campus missionaries and church planters and leaders, thank you for always leading with faith, hope, and love, especially during these trying times. While Deborah and I would sure rather be there with you in person, I am grateful that at least we're able to participate in our Southern Africa Rebuild Conference through this video. These are strange and uncertain times we're experiencing all over the world different than anything I have ever experienced or anything I've even imagined in my lifetime. What started as a global health crisis quickly turned into a global financial crisis that is creating a social and relational crisis. And for some people, it's becoming a spiritual crisis. A spiritual crisis can actually be a good thing when it causes people to turn to God or return to God. Solving the global health crisis and fixing the financial crisis is way above my pay grade. But as the people of God, we have a clear answer to the spiritual crisis. Right now, some people are blaming all of their health, financial, and relational problems on God. Others are pretending God doesn't exist, so now they're either trusting the government or self to solve their problems, and we know how that works out. But there are also millions around the world who are crying out to God for help. For these people, we have an answer. For the church, crisis time is a time to serve, to sacrifice, and to share the hope that is within us through the gospel of Christ. Let me tell you a story about a crisis that was sudden, unexpected, and deadly. It was tragic, but God used it for His purpose. Here's the background. The main building on the campus of Philippine Christian College in Cabanatuan City was built in 1964 with three stories. Several years later, three additional floors were added, making it the tallest building in the city. All seemed well until 4.26 p.m. on July 16, 1990, when a 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck. I'll never forget that moment. I was at home in Manila talking on the phone with my friend Julius when suddenly my floor started vibrating, things on the shelves started rattling, the, the shades on the windows started banging into each other, and the books on the bookshelves were shaking. 
The next thing I heard was a scream on the phone, and then the, Julius's phone hit the floor. I didn't know what happened, but a few hours later when we talked again, he said a bookshelf fell in the next room, and he was afraid that they might have fallen on his daughter. Fortunately, she was okay. As soon as Julius's phone hit the floor, I immediately went outside to see the damage that was done. I expected to see buildings crumbling all around me. But thank God there was little damage in Metro Manila. But 170 kilometers north in Cabanatuan, it was a completely different situation. The tallest building in Cabanatuan City, the sixth floor Philippine Christian College main administrative and classroom building had collapsed, crushing 154 people to death and injuring over 100 more. It was the only building in the city that fell completely. The foundations had held up for years, even with the additional three floors, until the shaking started. The shaking proved that the foundations were inadequate for six floors. Tragedy struck and lives were lost, not only because of the strength of the earthquake, but primarily because of the weakness of the foundations. Storms and shaking in life are inevitable. Fortunately, we have a way to storm-proof our lives. The words of Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, speak to this idea of how we can survive no matter how strong the storms are. Here's what he says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. This passage is the conclusion of the most famous sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever preached. Jesus ended his Sermon on the Mount with this simple but profound parable. In the parable, there are two builders, one wise, one foolish. There are two buildings, one strong, one weak. There are two foundations, one on the rock, one on the sand, and there are two completely different results after this fourfold storm hits. One stands, one falls. Now let's think about that fourfold storm for a moment. Verses 25 and 27 give the exact description of the storm that hits both houses. It wasn't any different. The same thing happened. Here's what it says. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house. The house built on the rock and the house built on the sand both experienced the same storm. Think about it a minute. Rains came down. That's what rain does. Floods, that's when the water rises. But then it says winds blew and winds beat. I think of that as it's like being surrounded. It's a picture of storms hitting from every side. It wasn't just one storm. Most of us can handle one storm at a time. But this is a picture of being surrounded and overwhelmed by storms from every side all at the same time. The way Jesus describes storms in this parable reminds me of the way that great philosopher and theologian Forrest Gump describe storms in Vietnam. Here's what he said. We've been through every kind of rain there is. Little bitty stinging rain and big old fat rain, rain that flew in sideways and sometimes rain seemed to come straight up from underneath. Shoot, it even rained at night. One day it started raining and it didn't quit for four months. Well, Perhaps Forrest Gump was prophesying about the world we're living in right now. But even in the midst of this COVID-19 health storm, this global financial crash, and the social isolation, our text reveals a way we can storm-proof our lives. Let me explain the idea of storm-proof for a moment. This watch on my wrist is a dive watch. That means it was designed to get wet. Not just a rain shower wet. It was designed to survive at a depth of 300 meters. Uh, now, I've never been deeper than 100 feet and no intention of ever diving even 100 meters, let alone 300 meters. The fact that this watch is waterproof does not mean that if I wear it in the ocean, it will not get wet. 
that would be a water-free watch. There are no water-free watches. Waterproof means that when it does get wet, the water does not negatively affect it. There is no biblical promise of a storm-free life, no matter what anyone else tells you. In fact, Jesus promised the opposite. John 16, 33, he says, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus never promised a storm-free life. The Sermon on the Mount ends with the promise of a storm-proof life about how to build a life that stands strong no matter how many storms hit it at once and no matter how long those storms last. So, how can I have a life like that? How can I as a spiritual leader help others build a life that will not be crushed by the storms of life? What is the difference in a life or a ministry that stands strong in the storm versus one that is destroyed by the storm? The answer is in verse 25. The house that was founded on the rock was still standing when the storm gave it its best shot. In other words, if our foundation is on the rock, we are storm proof. We're not storm free, but we're definitely storm proof. On the other hand, if our foundation is on the sand, the storm that will inevitably come will also destroy what we have built. To better understand foundations, I did what we all do. I googled the word. It didn't really help. The top hits were for makeup companies. I didn't expect that. The second most common hits were about charitable foundations. Those are really good, but that had nothing to do with this. Finally, I found some information about construction that was semi-helpful. The, the idea of building foundations as we build buildings. So to make sure I really understood what I was reading about foundations on a construction site, I called my friend, Pastor JT. Before JT was the men's pastor at our Every Nation Church here in Nashville, he built houses for a living. I mean, big houses with big foundations. JT really helped me understand the importance of foundations and also the process. He said that when building a house, obviously the foundations are the first things we build. He then went on to explain that there are at least five to ten different foundation options when building a home. It all depends on the soil, the weather, and the size or weight of the house. That's what determines which of the five or ten foundations is best for each particular house. Building on a beach requires one type of foundation. Building on a mountain or on a hill, another type. Building on flat ground has another one. If there's more rain or freezing weather, that requires something else. No matter what is being built and no matter where it is being built, the possible adverse weather conditions have to be taken into consideration. And foundation work must be done in order to predict and to prepare for the worst case scenario. When we built the Every Nation building in Manila, we were well aware that the Philippines is in the ring of fire, which is the Earth's most dangerous earthquake and active volcano zone. While the Philippine government requires strict building codes to survive the possible and probable earthquakes, our leadership team decided to spend extra money and take extra time to build not according to the Philippine standards, but we picked a place that had even worse earthquake problems, and we used the standards required in San Francisco. We did it just to be safe, just to be sure. But it was costly in terms of money and time. In the same way, when establishing spiritual foundations, wise builders recognize the potential destructive forces in the culture and in the spiritual climate where we're building. And then that wise builder is willing to pay the price and take the extra time to build according to the highest standards, not just what will get by, but what will protect us spiritually, no matter how intense the temptation or the persecution or whatever kind of storms hit. So, how we as individuals and how we as ministry units, churches, campus ministries, kids ministry, music ministry, or whatever, even businesses, how we survive this health, financial, and social storm will expose whether or not and to what degree we have built strong foundations. The question then is how do we build or rebuild strong spiritual foundations? How do we build on the rock? What does that mean? How do we storm-proof our lives, our families, our churches, our campus ministries? First, we must hear God's Word. 
or if we're pastors, preachers, we must preach God's Word. Our text starts with this phrase in verse 24. Everyone, not just spiritual leaders or pastors or vocational ministers, everyone who hears these words of mine, every good thing starts with a word from God. Even creation started with a word from God. Pastors and preachers, remember, the people who go to your church go because they need to hear from God. They don't go to hear from you. If you're not a pastor and you're not a preacher, then remember, you go to church not to hear your favorite preacher, but to hear the voice of God through the pastor. Not to critique the pastor's accent or grammar or style, but to hear God. What is God saying to you through that sermon and through that worship experience and through that pastor? It all starts with a word from God. Both builders in the parable heard the word, but one heard and did, and the other heard and did nothing. Do you hear and do, or do you tend to hear and do nothing? If we want strong foundations that storm-proof our lives, first, we need to hear God's Word. Second, we must be doers of the Word. James 1.22 exhorts us to be doers of the Word and not hearers who deceive ourselves. If we hear but don't act on it, we become self-deceived. Similarly, in John 4.34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. Every pastor and every campus missionary at some point has heard someone who came to them after a service or after a sermon to announce that they were leaving to find another church because they, quote, I'm not being fed. How many of you have heard that? I've heard it many times. It used to bother me a lot. It doesn't anymore. I'm sure those people are telling the truth that they're not being fed. But listen, that's not an indictment on the person preaching. It's an indictment on them. Jesus said food, spiritual food, is to do the will of God, not to hear it. When someone is not being fed, they're not getting food, it means they're not doing anything about what they know and what they hear. The obedience to the Word is what nourishes our spiritual lives. Yes, some are malnourished because there are shepherds who don't know how to prepare a nutritious meal. Yeah, that's true. But most who complain of, quote, not being fed are just telling on themselves. They're admitting they're not doers of the word. Don't be that person. In order to storm-proof our lives, we must first hear God's word. Second, we must put God's word into action. Do it. Practice it. We might not be very good at it, but we practice. And the more we practice, generally, the better we get. And finally, if we want to build strong foundations that will enable us to stand strong no matter the storm, we have to build on the rock, not on the sand. What does it mean to build on the rock? 1 Corinthians 10.4, after dropping some spiritual metaphors about Moses, the crossing of the Red Sea, the glory cloud, Paul then concludes, quote, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So here's Paul looking at Moses and saying the rock that Moses referred to was Christ. If Christ is the spiritual rock, then what we build on him will survive the storms. Another way to look at it is this. Whatever is destroyed by this storm or any other storms was probably not built on Christ in the first place. Often we assume we're building on Christ only to find out during the post-storm autopsy that we're actually building maybe fully or sometimes partially on sand and not rock. A couple of weeks ago, I visited Every Nation New York's Sunday service. My good friend Shino Prater had texted me on Saturday night asking if I would watch his sermon and give him some feedback. As expected, Pastor Shino's sermon was powerful. Soon as it was over, I sent him a text with encouraging feedback, telling him what I learned and how great the sermon was, and with a little bit of suggestion about his introduction. I also sent a text to Every Nation New York senior minister, Pastor Ron Lewis, telling him how powerful the online worship service was. Ron responded with a few texts back and forth, and then he said this on his text, What's your big thought about what's going on besides making disciples? I responded to Ron's text with this. I just put Matthew 7. 
This storm will show each of us how, where we have built on the sand rather than on rock. I don't think it's either or as if one builds 100% on rock, another builds 100% on sand. I think I build sometimes on rock, sometimes on sand. I'm trying to discern which parts of my ministry will stand and which parts will be swept away because of weak foundations. Then how to rebuild everything on the rock. I want to end with a story that underlines the importance of building foundations on rock rather than on sand. About 15 years ago, while making my way through the Singapore airport on one of those moving sidewalks, I noticed a huge indoor billboard on the wall with a picture of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I think it was an advertising a bank or maybe a car or hotel, something I don't remember. Uh, it must not have been a very good advert since I have no idea what the product was. But all these years later, I do remember the tagline. Here's what it said. Good facade, bad foundations. Too many Christians are like that leaning tower. They look good on the outside, but because of shallow and weak foundations, they start leaning toward collapse as soon as they emerge from the baptismal tank. Some are leaning so far that the smallest temptation or the little bit of persecution can potentially knock them down. Even though the tower began to lean early on in the construction process, moving ahead with the project was obviously more important than fixing the foundation, even when they knew there was a big problem. They kept trying to make it a functional building by compensating for the fact that this whole building was built on sinking sand. Somewhere along the way, the Italian architects just gave up and preserved it as a tourist attraction. Good facade, bad foundation. That's not how we want to build. That philosophy of building will not preserve us when the storms hit. With that in mind, I want to end this message with the familiar words written by Pastor Edward Motes almost 200 years ago. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand.
lifeless stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other Thank you. What an incredible reminder. And actually the truth, it's just simply the truth. On Christ, the solid rock, we build our lives. Friends, in moments like this where things are uncertain, we have to find a place of certainty. We have to find the solidness that we can believe in and explain and actually motivate people and encourage ourselves and our families to stand strong. And no better way to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. I mean, even uh, I'm reminded in John where, they say, where Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And it says, you are the son of God. And it says, on this rock, I will build my church. Friends, the strongest church we can build is where individuals, not just the church, but every individual based their lives, found themselves on the solid rock, Jesus Christ, where you make Jesus the anchor and not the news and everything else. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus in this time. And thank you, Pastor Steve. It's a great reminder, but I hope we take this home and really apply Jesus to our lives and keep our eyes on Him. Friends, as we conclude today, I want to pray for you. And many of you are sitting here and you're facing incredible challenges. You're facing business challenges. I mean, you may face UIF challenges and we know all of us are going through things. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the solid rock. And I want to pray for you right now that may God minister to you. You know, we, we're ministering on an online platform, but I believe the anointing of God is not limited to our platforms. And as I'm praying for you, would you extend your faith with me now and ask Jesus to intervene in your life, your family life and your business. Father God, we come to you right now and we thank you, Lord God, on Christ, the solid rock we build our lives. And Lord, as we are mindful of what you did on the cross in the midst of turmoil and everything came to an end when you died on the cross and we thought it, people thought it was the end. It wasn't. It was just the beginning of a new phase. It was the beginning of the new life that you released through your death on the cross. It was the moment, God, that set the world free when everything thought came to an end, Father, and we thought it's the end. It was the start of new life. And the same now we ask you, Father, that you began a good work in us, will be faithful to fulfill it to the end. And now we pray your blessing, Father, over your people's lives. Everyone listening, stir their hearts, lift their faith, God, lift their spirits, God, and we will keep our eyes on Jesus and not deviate from that. Lord, I pray for every businesswoman, every businessman. I pray for every business, every employee. Lord, that you would strengthen them. I pray for miraculous interventions God I pray for creative ideas I pray for provision in ways that we have not yet seen and for testimonies to be born, born out of the season God as we Father understand the purpose of you Father and the purpose of your kingdom we pray God that because of your purpose you will take us through the season God so we can fulfill your purpose on earth we pray this in Jesus name bless your people Amen friends as we conclude this morning, I've got great news for you. It's not the end. We're not yet done. I want to ask you, prepare your hearts. Join us for tonight. Tonight you're going to have an injection of even a little bit of local and USA. Pastor Tim Johnson will be ministering to us tonight also. Don't miss tonight. Invite your family and friends. It's Sunday. Why don't you call a few friends and invite a few family friends and people may, you may never invite to church. Why don't you invite them to tonight and may God touch their hearts tonight. God bless you and may you have an awesome Sunday afternoon. Enjoy the chicken. God bless you. Miss you guys. Cannot hope to, cannot wait to see you again. God bless.